So the first um, book I already mentioned, um, and that's Embracing the Concrete Desert. And I use a lot of symbolism on books. So again, anybody's version of a concrete desert. The second one is Embracing Dusty Detours. And it continues this journey um, going into the region a bit, Damascus and Istanbul and the Holy Lands. So, but both of these books are done in a similar style, a combination of vignettes, like thoughtful, reflective vignettes and poems. And my poems are often prayerful or will echo a theme that I've written on in a vignette. And Lucy, can you hold up the last, that last book up? Yeah. So this is the third one, and it, uh, that's great, thank you. And it's just for fun. It is a work of fiction, and um, I loved doing it, but it is in the genre of like a cozy mystery, and um, it is, it brings to life some of the settings and characters that we grew to love in Egypt, and but done in a whimsical way. So the story is about uh, Reverend Ball, who is the priest in the Episcopal Church in Cairo, and his wife, Mrs. Ball, who is an eccentric wife, and she gets in all sorts of quandaries trying to sleuth out this mystery that has appeared. She also suspects that her Reverend Ball is an undercover spy. In addition to being a priest, a double opportunity, as she comes to call it. So, and the word, the title, um, Mrs. Ball investigates a bishop kidnapped in Egypt. So the title, Mrs. Ball, was something I was often called in Cairo because Paul Gordon's name was a mouthful in Arabic. And so it became Paul. And they don't have the letter P sound in Arabic. Closest is ball, B, so ball. And, um, it, so, and in that cultural context, as his wife, I was often called Mrs. Ball. Unless people had advanced English, then they could do the P. But um, it, it got humorous when Paul Gordon became the uh, canon of the Episcopal Cathedral in Cairo. And then we would sometimes hear him introduced as Reverend Cannonball. <laughs> <laughs> and like to them, that meant nothing but to his family. <laughs> Anyway, so that's, that was a fun. <laughs> he got rid of that title now. So, but so, yeah, so I've chosen three vignettes and three poems from each of the two books. And um, the first one I wanted to read is called I'm Adopting a City. And city, again, is a metaphor for anything that seems impossible to adopt, end up impossible to embrace with perhaps a way forward on how to do so. Waging an inner battle against an ancient city is a really bad idea. I don't recommend it to anyone. The city is a lot bigger, <clears throat> a lot older than you are, a lot more indifferent to individual struggles, and you won't win. In fact, it's a waste of your time. If you ever find yourself wanting to run from such a problem, I suggest you make friends with the city instead. Invite it to tea or to dinner. Don't expect it to bring you flowers. Don't expect it to bring you a box of your favorite chocolates. Unless the city has invited you to evaluate the status of its garbage collection system, its smog levels, or the treatment of some of its inhabitants or plans to replace anything remotely green with concrete, then you need to keep your mouth shut tightly. If your mouth is shut tightly, then no one will get hurt. Soon your brain will cooperate and start to look for good things to celebrate. If someone in this city is unkind to you, remember the little old man who sits by the fruit stand on Shara Tessa who offered you a chair to sit on when you were waiting for the bakery to open. If that doesn't help, remember the little old woman with the deep brown wrinkles who sits on the pavement by the mosque every Friday or how about the little children who don't go to school but follow you around as if you were the Pied Piper until you hand over the lollipops that they know from experience are in your purse? These kind of situations need to be embraced, not rejected. A per place like a person needs to feel accepted by you. 
why not think about adopting it? If you decide that's a good idea, you will eventually stop telling yourself how hard it is to love. Instead, you will learn to love it. Why not? Maybe you could even think of some ways to make it happier. No one will tell you that that is a waste of time. One day, after you have been nice to your city for quite a while, you will wake up and find that it likes you. It might not tell you it's happy that you have adopted it, but your heart will know it was a good idea. If the layer of smoggy misery on your heart starts to disappear, the sun can shine straight in. And if the sun shines straight in, your heart will smile and grow bigger, and you will start to feel as if you live in a field of beautiful flowers, people flowers. Every one of these flowers in your adopted city may look different, but you are all interconnected, created by God. The great gardener of the flowers is very happy with his work. He has done a good job. He has brought you to this city to live among them, and you are now one of its flowers too. So, and the poem, I don't mean to clap, the poem I want to read uh, with that is called A Desert Caravan. I joined a desert caravan. It would take several years to cross. What I imagined to be adventure over rolling seas of sand quickly turned to wilderness, a dry and barren land. Mirages of wells and oases plagued me, saddle sores and tears. My fitful dreams were forced to change. I had to trust my guide. He'd led many a caravan this way. He would bring me to the other side. My heart began to listen to my camel's story. She had much to teach me of faith. Perfectly designed for this very journey. Eyes, ears, nose, and hooves. No detail forgotten in her maker's planning. She willingly carried me. Did I as well have gifts to fit me for this journey? I would have to search within. <clears throat> this next uh, vignette I want to read is called Other Children's Lives, and it's just a glimpse of something I saw outside our window one day with our kids. My children were complaining of boredom the other weekend. I persuaded them to play some board games. As we were setting things up, we heard the familiar clip-clop of a donkey cart right outside our window. We glanced out and saw two young boys, no more than 10 years old. They were driving a cart overloaded with garbage that they had probably been collecting since early morning. As they pulled up to the building next door, they found bins overflowing, waiting to be emptied. The contents would then be taken by these children back to their parents, who lived with them in what is known as the Village of Garbage in Cairo's district of Mukatam. <clears throat> there, the valuable process of sorting, recycling, and disposal would begin. It's a place of paradox, physically filthy, but spiritually beautiful. To visit the homes of the children who live there is both heart-wrenching and inspiring. The glaring need for compassionate assistance to these garbage collectors and their families has captured the hearts of many people. And now schools, medical assistance, places of worship, and a viable recycling center all exist within this garbage village. Half of the garbage the children outside my window were assigned to collect was in the bins. The other half carelessly littered the ground. Both boys scampered down from their cart and began the tedious task of picking up the strewn waste. The donkeys waited patiently. Armed security guards from the building stood over the boys, refusing even a smile. I looked back at my two well-fed, well-clothed, bored children who had witnessed the scene with me. They com commented on the underfed donkeys and how dangerous the work must be for the boys who had no shoes to wear. Complaints of boredom vanished. The boys finished their task, climbed back onto their cart, 
and turn their donkeys toward the next building. Donkeys were the first local animals to capture my heart. Their eyes are so kind and trusting. Our church supports a wonderful donkey protection organization run by an old Muslim veterinarian here. Through his work, we are able to provide humane harnesses, training on the importance of daily food and fresh water, and veterinarian care for families throughout Cairo. So many lives depend on the health and longevity of their donkeys. The poem with that is called A Middle Eastern Donkey. To be born a Middle Eastern donkey, some say it is a curse. He hobbles the streets with sores from whips, swung by those who do not care. Enabling livelihood is all that's on their owners' minds. Beasts a burden to help, but always more children to feed. When will the cycle of poverty end? I caught his eye as he limped by one day. Grace, endurance, pride. It was a Middle Eastern donkey that my Lord chose to ride. This next one is about prayer, and in Cairo, prayer was very public and very private at the same time. Um, it's a glimpse of a holy moment. The Islamic holy month of Ramadan had just begun, and it was a perfect occasion to talk about prayer with our youngest church school members. Had anyone ever seen someone praying outside? Why did they think the people bowed down and touched their heads to the ground? Had anyone ever been to Jerusalem? Had they seen the old temple wall and people putting pieces of paper into its stone cracks? Why did we sometimes fold our hands to pray? Why did we often close our eyes? We had successfully explored the Lord's Prayer and clarified the usual confusion about hallowed and trespasses. And they were going to say the prayer again when they rejoined their parents during Holy Communion. Next, we moved on to prayers in our hearts, how we had prayers to say thank you, and also prayers that made our hearts feel a little bit heavy. Our craft activity was to decorate a prayer box with a slit in the top and then squeeze in our heart prayers, one happy, one more serious, written or drawn on paper. The youngest boy drew himself as a stick figure with coat hanger-shaped arms folded reverently. Some kept asking for more pieces of colored paper on which to write new prayers, springing to mind moment by moment. Others put in their two prayers and just smiled peacefully. No one explained to them the idea of putting a prayer in a box so they could let go of their worries or make the thank you more tangible, but they knew it intuitively. They are too young to have fallen into prayer ruts. Nothing has derailed their channels of communication with God yet. Some children chose to show everyone their finished prayers before the papers disappeared into the box, but most didn't. The prayers that were enthusiastically verbalized usually had to do with a sick friend or a family member. Thank you prayers were very popular. Some prayers quickly became dramatic, for example, mentioning a crime that had been committed and including prayers for the criminal as well as the victim. Then they moved on to prayers about pets and then animals in general. I could picture Jesus gathering the little children to himself and enjoying their chatter. No wonder he used the an analogy that we must become like little children in order to enter the kingdom of heaven. I really felt I should suggest they preach the next sermon. They were in tune without trying living the essence of prayer. I wondered at the beauty of what I had experienced with the children that day as I was reminded of another image of prayer I had seen just outside the walls of our churchyard. Passing a deserted corner plot, I had noticed how it reeked horribly of garbage roasting in the heat. As I glanced toward the offending source, I noticed a garbage collector bending down to carefully arrange a rescued piece of clean cardboard. The Islamic call to prayer was echoing in the distance. In response, the old man knelt down, bowed faithfully and reverently until his forehead touched the ground, 
humbling himself before God. In stumbling across this scene, I felt I had glimpsed a holy moment, a spot that, at my first glance, was a place of rotting garbage, had been transformed into a place of prayer. And my poem with that is The Road I Walk. Would Jesus walk the road I walk if he trod earth again? I thought I saw his face today, but it was an old Muslim man. He'd spread his cardboard on the ground and bowed to say a prayer. Perhaps what I saw was insincere. Would God even hear his words? But as I passed by silently, I knew my Lord was there. That's from the first book. And this next one is called Look Into the Eyes, and it's just about seeing, looking into someone's eyes and truly seeing. This morning after I dropped Tristan off at school, I decided to stop at my favorite bakery nearby. The creative vision of two Egyptian brothers who grew up in America has given us this shop, which has doubled in size since we arrived. Fresh whole wheat bread, bagels, and our favorite cheesecake are all part of the draw. But today I was in search of a shortcut for the brunch I was hosting the next morning, spinach quiche. When I reached the Baker Street, the only parking spots I could find were filled with garbage. In recent years, garbage has taken over our streets. I blame the banning of slow-moving donkey carts in our area. But who knows where the real source of the problem lies. I managed to park my car along the edge of a uh, garbage pile, and only the empty passenger side was glued to the debris. I waited for traffic to clear and then got out to buy my quiche. As I was walking across the road, I was feeling mildly guilty that I would have to pay so much for the luxury of not baking the food from scratch that I reckon my priorities could be justified, at least to myself. Quiche in hand, I received and gave the blessing of God's peace, ma salama, as I left the bakery and made my way back to my car. As I was waiting to cross the street, a small pickup truck heaped to the sky with garbage slowly rumbled by. I often unconsciously filter out such a scene because the layers of dirt and grime build up and so quickly in my mind it weigh me down over time like a suffocating sarcophagus. Inwardly, I then get into the cycle, begging for nature and fresh air to relieve my heaviness, and on and on I go. It's easier just to filter out such things from the start. But today, I chose to look up. And on the summit of the truck's garbage heap was a boy staring down at me. He was probably my son's age. While my son was at school learning, here was this young teen working to help sustain his family's livelihood. His eyes locked into mine. They were brown and warm, full of respect and courage. He didn't smile with his mouth, as it wouldn't have been culturally appropriate in that situation, but he did smile with his eyes. I smiled back just slightly, hoping he could sense my blessing and my respect for him. His life couldn't have been more different from the life of my own son but they were both worthy of admiration because maneuvering the challenges of teenage years is never easy. The lingering moment between the boy and me stretched out so long that I couldn't hold back my tears as I imagined the hopes and fears of this young life that connected with and blessed me just for one moment in time. It caught me off guard. How much am I missing by hiding my eyes and burrowing into my protective shell, by paying attention to what an uneventful day could offer? I'm sure I could link in more closely to the daily workings of my Creator. Bless that dear Lord, I prayed, that dear boy, Lord, I prayed, and bless all those vulnerable, marginalized children that you have created, young and old, and mine too. They are not, not out of your grasp. May they be aware of your presence, sustaining them today. I climbed back into what now felt like a luxury car, our little dented green Renault. 
my heart started jumping around like a Middle Eastern fly, trying to escape destruction on a hot, scorching summer day. Yet I kept returning in my mind to the lasting gift I had been given by that moment with the boy on the garbage truck. The most enduring and transforming gifts we are given are rarely tangible. They are gifts from above, and they often arrive when we least expect them, but perhaps most need them. Receiving such gifts may involve no more than looking into the eyes of another and truly seeing. If only I could remember the simple instruction my mother gave me when, as a child when meeting someone new, look into their eyes. The poem with that is called, I Am There. My eye is watching over all I have made. Look for me, I am there. Search more deeply than you ever have before. In the presence of all suffering, I am there. Shout anger, pain, despair, longing. Look for me, I am there. In a cry of distress or the sound of laughter, look for me, I am there. Search more deeply than you ever have before. In the presence of all happiness, I am there. Sing thanks, joy, praise, admiration. Look for me, I am there. <laughs> This next one is just for fun. It is about a Pentecost that we will never forget. Um, if you were in Sheridan last year, you saw Paul Gordon launch this um, beautiful dove into the air at the end of the service, um, symbolizing God's spirit going out into the world. And Warland is, they're on the search for the white bird right now. <laughs> so where should I begin? My African dog ate the Pentecost dove. <laughs> no, too cruel. My dog is a loving creature. She would never hurt a fly. Well, maybe I have seen her skillfully snap up a few inseparable flies in her time. It was Thursday evening, Pentecost Eve, as our holy day here in Egypt is Friday. Paul Gordon and I had returned from leading a reflective evening worship service. The meditative songs were still quietly replaying in my head. Earlier that day, my husband had made the annual pilgrimage to the local bird store to pick up the pure white dove he had ordered in advance. It was always an exciting moment for our family each year when he returned home with the Pentecost bird, full of life and meaning and wonder. We would inspect its feathers to make sure it was actually pure white. As the first time we decided to inaugurate this tradition, our requested white dove was sprinkled with black feathers and the bird shop owner had to rush to secure a last minute white substitute. Once Paul Gordon had explained to the bird man that this was like needing a pure white sheep for the Muslim feast of Aid al Adha, then naturally only white birds appeared. I had, it had become a special tradition to release a dove in the church garden at the end of our Pentecost Day service in celebration of the Holy Spirit's coming and that ongoing presence in our lives. Actually, the dove was always a pure white homing pigeon, able to fly straight home and avoid city hawks on its route. Having raised birds in Africa as a child, Paul Gordon's enthusiasm for these feathered friends was catching. He would hold the bird carefully for the children to see during the worship service time and explain about God's Holy Spirit and the symbolism of the dove. Last year, the first question he asked the children was, what does this bird remind you of? Immediately, a little boy's hand shot up with the answer, Jesus Christ. Thankfully, the little boy wasn't asked to expound theologically, but his inspiration was woven into the lesson. After explaining how we would all be saying some words together later about the coming of God's spirit before releasing the dove in the garden, the final question my husband asked was, does anyone know what we will say when we release this dove? Another hand shot up, goodbye. <laughs> These astute children keep us on our toes. 
Back to Thursday evening. It was well past 11 p.m. when our daughter burst into our room in a panic. Where is the Pentecost bird? In a box in the office, my husband replied as he rushed past me out the door. We arrived to a scene of countless white feathers and our big gentle dog Pepsi cowering in the corner looking suspiciously like the cat that swallowed the canary. The bird's box was tipped over onto the floor. It was gone. Could Pepsi have swallowed it whole? She looked dreadfully confused and afraid. I refused to pry open her jaws and look for evidence. <laughs> we searched high and low, no sign of the bird, only feathers all over the floor. I didn't know whether to laugh or cry. Being a vegetarian, it was beyond me to imagine that my own pampered pup could succumb to her inbred hunting dog instincts and annihilate an ancient Christian symbol. We eventually found the little winged creature hiding in a corner of our apartment, still alive, but visibly not long for this world. Then I cried. My husband was being more practical and in anxiety realized that it was now 11.30 p.m. and he had to have a Pentecost dove in hand before our morning service. The bird shop was closed and would not open until after midday prayers the following day. Since Egypt is a night culture, however, there was still a chance to track down a pigeon fancier in an apartment rooftop loft and beg for help. An hour later, Paul Gordon returned beaming with success and carrying a gorgeous pure white bird, double the usual price, having risked life and limb climbing up a rickety homemade ladder to a 10th floor loft, but now boasting of the bird's acrobatic tumbling talents in addition to its homing instincts. <laughs> Pentecost had been saved. Our children were sworn to secrecy until the Pentecost send-off had been successfully launched and no one was any the wiser the next morning as the dove flew powerfully into the air after the congregation had prayed together, come Holy Spirit, fill our hearts and kindle in us the fire of your love. I haven't dared to ponder the symbolic significance of the whole event, but it will certainly be a Pentecost to remember. <laughs> uh, and the Pentecost poem that went with that, your promised gift arrives. Fire, wind, whirling voices, a sensing of your power, newfound courage, strength and hope, your promised gift arrives. Timeless imagery, dove of peace, living symbols of love. Yet for all these gifts, I would rather experience your physical presence, Lord. To trust, to follow, to be led through the shadows by the guiding grace of your hand. Some days the path brings more questions than answers as emotional earthquakes engulf. Some days the light shines down so brightly a quiet voice whispers my name. Still present, your sacred energy fills me and fills my being and wills me to live. And the last one I read, want to read is called God's Fingerprints. And it's just about seeing God in the ordinary events of our everyday lives. This morning, I called the local grocer to order some food to be delivered to my apartment. I didn't identify myself and they don't have caller ID, but at the end of the conversation, the man at the other end asked, no Diet Coke today, madame? <laughs> Surprised that he knew my list better than I did, I thanked him for reminding me. When I hung up, I realized how much, after living more years in Cairo than I ever imagined possible, I really do love the people of Egypt, whom I find in my path, walking by my side, inquiring about the well-being of my family, in some cases even down to our beloved dog, believe it or not, on a daily basis. I feel as if I've climbed an enormous mountain over the years, and now I'm getting to enjoy the spectacular view only visible from the summit. Yesterday I had lunch at a luxury hotel along the Nile River, sampling food for our annual charity auction fundraiser next fall. 
the Egyptian Belgian general manager of the hotel had generously agreed to donate food at cost for the 400 guests we expected to attend. What began as a small church spaghetti dinner five years ago, bringing in several thousand dollars to fund local charities, has now grown to be a huge event, bringing in tens of thousands of dollars each year and anticipated and supported by people from all walks of life, from Muslims to Christians to people who would never set foot in a mosque or church, but have very generous hearts. Tickets for auction tables last year were sold out before they were even printed. Right now, six months ahead, we're getting requests for table reservations for next year's event. Half the committee planning members are from our church, and the other half just earnestly want to help the needy here in Egypt. It's a wonderful dynamic. A young adult from our church is currently visiting the 20 projects around Egypt that we sponsor, taking photos and gathering transformational stories. Christians and Muslims alike are recipients of these outreach projects from special education for marginalized disabled children to support for Sudanese refugees. With undesignated gifts, we are able to step in during times of crises and provide support to those who literally have no material resources. The woman I was sitting next to during our gourmet lunch was not part of our church community, but commented out of the blue, I love the donkey project. I've supported so many now through the church. My kids are totally into it. If I couldn't do anything to help here, I would get so depressed. Last week, I walked into a stationery store and asked a question of the owner, whom I had never personally met before. He immediately asked me how my husband was and how things were going at church. Clearly, Paul Gordon had blazed a trail there. Sometimes it's a bit eerie to think that everyone knows my business. But when I walk into the local cafe and my usual drink is on the counter, practically before I can reach the cash register, and all the smiling staff are sincerely asking after my husband and children, I can't think of any reason not to embrace the whole situation. When I walk into my apartment building, I'm told who is at home and who is our way by our ever faithful building attendants. Our fa favorite restaurant owner wonders when one child is missing for the weekly family dinner out, and taxi drivers hand me unpaid bills to give to my husband. <laughs> the local electrician saw me out of context in the store recently, came running over to greet me, and the deaf man, who regularly helps us park our car on a crowded street, was jumping up and down at the sight of us last week because we'd given him a few bags of used shoes and clothing. We actually think he made it in big with the women and his large extended family because he kept making jewelry signs and long dress signs and giving us a huge smile and thumbs up. I try to look for God's fingerprints generously displayed over all the coincidences of my life. Each day I wake up and remind myself that years of pollution in my lungs will not destroy me, but being unaware or ungrateful for the abundance of blessings being poured out to me daily, just might. And the last poem I want to read is called Silence and Simplicity. Silence, the sound of calm within. Learn from the stillness. Listen. Simplicity, the will to listen deeply, in tune uncluttered, at peace. A gift whose source is overflowing, seek a sacred life. Live intentionally, shelter the wind, direct your heart with purpose. All that is past, all that is present, all that is to come, it stands in silence, awaiting consent. Choose life. Embrace it now.